Welcome to the RF Elements Unlicensed Podcast. I'm Caleb. We've got Tassos over here. Hello. And this week, we are excited to be hosting Elijah Zeta from Airbridge Broadband in Idaho. So, say hi, Elijah. Hello. Hey. So, uh, we'll get to your story in one real quick one second. But before we do, Tassos, give the good people out there their call to action. Yes, don't forget to like, listen, or subscribe to our channel right here on YouTube or anywhere you download your audio podcast, like Spotify, Google, and the other one. All right, Elijah. So, really appreciate you taking the time to talk to us today. I know you're a busy guy and everything. So, uh, we're excited to kind of hear about, you know, what you guys are doing out there. Uh, but I guess first, you know, kind of give us some history, how you got started in the industry, how you, you found yourself in this position that you, you've turned into, and um, just, you know, what you're doing out there. Sure. Yeah, so uh, it started, gosh, probably about almost seven years ago. Um, I was doing just a lot of just odd jobs here and there, weed whacking, uh, just with handyman, stuff like that. Um, I had a little computer business on the side where I'd fix computers, things like that. I've always enjoyed technology, uh, computers, and IT and uh, long story short, there was a guy named Bruce who started a, uh, he, he wanted better internet at his house, uh, no matter how much he begged and paid the, <laughs> the wisp of the day to get him better internet, they just wouldn't do it, right? And so he contacted a nephew of his who had, was a par, uh, part owner of a wisp down in Utah, and he helped him get better internet to his house. Well, of course... His neighbors heard about it, wanted on it, their neighbors, their neighbors, their neighbors. So anyway, one day I heard about it and I called the guy and got on it. Uh, it was great, a lot better than HughesNet and all the others. And uh, anyway, so gosh, a couple of years of using this guy's internet, I, I called him up one day and and uh, he was like, hey, would, would you like to work for me? I never met the guy a day in my life because he actually <laughs> lived a few hours south. And he so he'd come up and work on it and, and things like that here and there. So he, he moved down down to near Boise. And, uh, so never met the guy a day in my life. And I was like, yes. So, uh, he had heard, heard about me just through some of his other customers. I had worked on their computers and, and things like that. So he had heard my name floating around. And, um, so I was, I was, I was super excited and, uh, worked with him for a couple of years. I did installs, technical support, uh, helped him with infrastructure, just kind of wore all the hats. Um, that was, uh, he had about 150 ish customers at the time. And, um, that was called backwards wireless. And, uh, anyway, uh, about a hundred and when, when he got to about 180, 190 customers, he was kind of, uh, he kind of wanted out. And so he contacted some friends of his, uh, so long story short, some friends of his, uh, started Airbridge broadband, bought him out and, uh, I came along for the ride. That was about six, seven years ago. And so throughout the evolution of this, I've seen it go from about 150 customers to, bit over 5,000 right now, uh, and growing, growing rapidly. Um, I've done everything from installs to infrastructure, to office network administration, currently doing network engineering. Uh, so I've kind of, I've kind of worn all the hats Cur currently wear multiple different hats when, when needed. Uh, but it's been, it's been a fun ride and, and got to loot, see a lot of cool things, meet a lot of cool people and just do some, do some amazing things. Well, I mean, that's, that's a cool story. You know, it's a familiar one. So many of these whiffs over there have started up because they're like, hey, there's no internet. Or, you know, someone rolls up with the, <laughs> the free internet yeah. sign on the side of the van and they're like, hey, kid, you want to come in here? So, yeah. Um, but yeah, it's, it's yeah, always well, a really go, it's good. Well, I, I was going to say, this is the topology around here is really difficult. We have a lot of hills and valleys. Um, and so, you know, like where I'm here now is like 3,200 feet and you, you can go just like 10 miles and drop down to like 800 feet. And so there's just a lot of rolling hills, valleys, mountains, and things like that. So it's a really tough area. And, uh, it's just, you know, you, you'd be doing good to get 12 megabits per second from, you know, DSL a half a mile away from the central office. But then you go out of town. I mean, I mean, you know, um, the, the incumbent of the, of here, I think, they, they were like, it was going to be like $5,000 to go wow. like a half a mile just to get us DSL. And they, they said we'd be doing good to get a megabit per second. And so, um, yeah. And so, uh, you know, when I, when I first started with Airbridge broadband, I think, I think we immediately put it to like 50 megabits per second over the wireless. And so, 
um, it's it's been a lot of been a lot of fun. No, that's cool. So um, you mainly residential, or you've got business mixed in, or kind of what's the spread there? So we do residential and business. We don't di- we don't differentiate differentiate between the two. Uh, so our we have our plans are for businesses and residential. Um, and so we, we do have more residential than businesses, but we do have a ton of businesses, uh, just because we are more reliable, faster, better customer service than really any of the incumbents and, uh, any, anybody else in the area. So do you, um, do you have any like SLAs? I mean, it's the same for both. I mean, there's really no distinguishing between the two. So from our point of view, there's no distinguishing between the two. We have no SLAs. We don't have any of that. Um, we we offer a flat fee, uh, 40, 50, 60 bucks a month, 100 bucks a month, whatever plan you want to go with. Um, businesses, residential, get the same get the same service, get the same quality of service, um, everything. Everything's the, the same for us. Wow, cool. How about static IPs and stuff like that? Yes, we offer public static IPs if people want. Um, we obviously NAT a ton of IPv4 addresses. Uh, for the majority of our customers, but if people want a, a public IP, we do offer that service for an extra ten dollars a month. Takes less than five minutes to set up, so um, we we do offer that. Uh, no no monthly contracts, uh, so um, we kind of see that as we try to set ourselves apart from the the competition, right? And so we do no monthly contracts, and we kind of in a way see that as helping hold ourselves accountable because we know that the customer can just call us up one day and say, Hey, I'm switching. Right. And Uh so it helps us keep ourselves accountable on the fact that we need to provide a good service to the customers, knowing that they're not locked into a contract and that they can switch anytime. That is great. I mean, you know, as we all know, customer service is king, especially when you're dealing with coming in user business or something like that. So you know, when you're not the incumbent, you actually have to like compete and provide good services and stuff like that. But it's also really easy to take over market share. I mean, you know, it sounds like you guys have had a ton of growth, you know, over a relatively short amount of time. So that's good coverage. Mm-hmm. Um, how much area do you cover? Just like just town cities, you know, if you were, if you were kind of going to go edge to edge on the network, you <laughs> know, but roughly how far would that be? So right now it would probably take, gosh, I would say almost three hours north south uh, to to go from one end to the other. Uh, east west would probably take two hours um, ish, uh, mostly just because of the topography. So uh-huh. we cover in the town. Uh, although the biggest the biggest town in this area currently that we coverage um, has I think it's thirty five hundred people in it or so. Uh, and so it's not a huge town, but there's a lot of other little towns here and there. And so we, we cover middle of town outside of town just about the whole entire area uh and so that that's about how that's about how big we are so are you doing mostly like uh mountain tops and stuff like that are your towers on top of mountains or are you down in town and maybe using the the hills and stuff as isolation between your towers <laughs> so the way the topography is here is we actually have a, a few big mountains um on the sides of the prairie we have a prairie here and then we have a valley down below Yep. And so we kind of do both. We actually prefer not to put a tower up on the tallest hill. And, you know, we do have a couple of towers up on us, up on some tall hills. Um, but we mostly see those as last, last ditch efforts for uh, customer hookups. We prefer uh, instead of putting up, you know, five 200 foot monstrosities to do, you know, a dozen 40 footers. So um, the, the probably 90, 95% of our towers are 40 feet or less. And uh, yeah. we we have one eighty footer and one ninety footer. Um, but those are the tallest towers we have. Uh, otherwise, we prefer to do a ton of smaller towers so we can get that density and we can get those short shots. So that's one thing that also sets us apart from the competition. Is the competition will have that really tall tower five miles out of town uh, that's on a tall hill. And so by the time the RF gets to town, the RF will be uh, weak. And, uh, you know, a lot of noise and things like that. And so we're doing those half mile, mile, three, four, five mile shots. Um, we obviously do have those 10 mile shots out there, uh, but we try to make those more of an exceptions than, than the rule. Nice. Interesting. And I mean, I've got to imagine too, like 
it gets a little chilly up there during the winter, and uh, conditions can get a little <laughs> thick sometimes. So, Tazos and I are both from regions yes. that never actually see snow. <laughs> so when we see people, you know, Idaho and then northern parts of the country, and you know, some of the work conditions they have to deal with, we're like, nope, not for us. It's not going to happen. So, but I imagine you know, not. Yep. You know, having a lot of that infrastructure up on those ridges, and, and that helps a lot, too, you know, because you're not having to spend two days to get up to a site to, to it does. You know, manage power and generators and all that. So, very interesting. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, For your distribution, are you mainly 5 gig, or are you doing some CBRS, or kind of what's the mix look like? So, um, pretty much all of the access points are 5 gigahertz. Uh, and then uh, we, we did put up one CBRS access point. It was either late last year or early this year. Uh, so, we did put up one CBRS AP. There's not that many people on it, you know, a few people. Um, but, uh, but the majority of the access points are 5 gigahertz. And then the 90 plus percent of the backhauls are licensed, though. Um, so, 90 percent of the backhauls are going to be 11 um, gigahertz. Uh, well, I guess 24 isn't technically licensed, but it's not five gigahertz. Then you have 60 gigahertz, which is, I guess, technically unlicensed, but there's not much interference there. Um, and then we have licensed light, which is 80 gigahertz, which we have like some sick loose, uh, for, for backhauls. Uh, but That's the good. majority of our backhauls are, are going to be the 11s. Um, and we do have a few five gigahertz backhauls out there. I don't really like using them <laughs> other than for like the outlying areas uh, where there's not a lot of RF and it's just like kind of like that last hop to that last tower. There's only a few people coming off of it. And so it doesn't make, it's not financially sound to put, you know, a $6,000 backhaul <laughs> up uh, to, for, for a few people. And yeah. so in those cases, um, we were doing like power beam 620s. Uh, but then I got the rocket prisms, ubiquity rocket prisms, and I paired them with the RF element uh, parabolic dishes, the ultra dish, and huh? man, it made the world a difference uh, between those two things. So cool. So I mean, so, yeah. so that's that's good uh, using you know spectrum other than your multi point spectrum, right? So a lot of yes. wisps, you know, we see them they they start with five gig on their multi point and their point to point, and there's there seems to be some transition point right where you finally can afford let's say to go license whatever uh, how did you guys start mm -hmm. did you guys just start with uh licensed on your back calls or did you grow into that so backwards wireless i was telling about um was actually pretty much all five giggers just using power beam m5 400 so i'm i go back in the m5 days oh. uh was using pretty much five gigahertz but as soon as airbridge broadband came in uh, it was pretty much all all licensed 24 gigahertz so one of one of the owners of Airbridge Broadband, he he's been in the business for 20 years. He's a super smart guy. Um, he's been a network engineer for uh, multiple different WISPs, and I've learned a lot from him. And so uh, when he came in, he he brought a lot, ton of knowledge, and pretty much started out with with licensed backhauls. Who were you guys using for your license uh, stuff? The Air Fiber 11s. Uh, is the biggest is what we're using right now for the 11 gigahertz um, mostly ubiquity products still uh -huh. um, for even for the the backhauls and the the point multi points the ltu uh, the prisms um, for five five gigahertz we do have a couple other like legal wave six gigahertz and uh, and things like that but it's pretty much uh, we have a few mimosa b11s but after comparing the Air Fiber 11 and the B11, I prefer the Air Fiber 11. I think it's a superior product, even though it only does 56 megahertz instead of 80. Um, I can take two Air Fiber 11s, put, a, put them along the same path, and uh, get I get way better uh, service. I think than than putting up a than putting up a B11. Very cool. Very cool. Um, have you guys looked at doing any fiber, or you know, is that kind of tough with your terrain and layout and things like that? It's really tough for the terrain. There's not a lot of ton of density here. Um, so there is a, there's a town uh, up north that has some dark fiber that we're looking at getting put or put our equipment in and you know get on that dark fiber. Um, there is some talk about doing fiber here. Not a lot. A lot of it's going to be done with the, the grant money that's going to be coming out because it's just really not feasible and viable for a small business to run fiber in the area just because there's all only 1500 homes here in town and the majority of homes are outside that area where you're at you know acres two three four acres uh, uh, per lot and it just becomes way too expensive to get fiber out to these homes 
Yeah, I mean, and that really plays into the tool and the toolbox approach. You know, we we see a lot of whiffs yes. that are going hybrid, but you know, or you know, a lot of people are like, "Oh, this is the only solution." But I mean, realistically, every terrain is different. You know, I'm sure you're. You got a lot of rocky sort of stuff I'm imagining in your ground. So to go dig it up and trench and everything's probably problematic. Uh, your aerial stuff, I mean, I'm sure you're facing issues and stuff with that too. So, I mean, you've always got to have yeah. the density, right? So, yep. yeah, fixed wireless is definitely viable. It is. I can give you a really good example on different tools for the toolbox. So we have a bigger town, which is we're looking at you know, getting on the dark fiber, right? And then, uh, you know, here in town, we have uh, wireless and possibly doing fiber. Uh, then we, we service a town that's a couple hours away. And the only way to get there is over a mountain that is powered solely by uh, solar that goes oh. up and down during the winter, right? Uh, they have generators up there, but sometimes the generators don't work, run out of fuel, whatever. It goes down. So we actually purchased a Starling Tish. And uh, so in this town, two hours away, we have about five different towers and we have, it all goes to, to one tower. And then that one tower goes to the top of the mountain and out. Right. So we actually purchased a Starling dish and we put it at one of the towers in this town they have. So I configured it so that when the, uh, the, the main link going over the tall mountain goes down, customer data automatically flows out the Starlink dish. And uh, it was really cool. I don't know if you guys have ever heard of a tool. It's called Zero Tier. It does SD-WAN solutions. Uh, it's a layer two virtual switch. Um, it's a package you can put on Microtik routers, the new okay. router OS 7. And uh, so anyway, so I can put a uh, uh, on a router at our head end and a router down here. It's in its town called Elk City. Uh, using zero tier, I can create a, a layer two virtual switch through the Starlink. I created a, an OSPF connection through that. And so then customer data flows out the Starlink. Management flows through OSPF, a layer two virtual connection through OSPF. And so we can maintain management of all our devices yeah. um, in, in Elk City, but customer data flows out the Starlink. So different tools, you know, places like Elk City, two hours plus away. You know, some people out there were like, just get Starlink, right? Just just get Starlink. It's going to be your best bet. And even we use Starlink on those outlying areas just as a backup, uh, just in case the main link goes down. Um, so you have a lot of tools in your toolbox and, and you can just use what works best. Yeah. Speaking of backup and stuff, I mean, what does LTE, 4G, 5G coverage look like in your area? So uh, cellular is terrible in our area. Um, you have the, the one, t you know, the one antenna up on the tallest hill <laughs> that gets, hits a lot of the area. But other than that, you know, you dip down in the valleys and you have nothing. In fact, a, we, we promote, a lot of times we promote uh, Wi-Fi calling mm -hmm. through like uh, Verizon or something yeah, like yeah. that um, as, as a viable solution to a problem uh, for people. And so cellular, LTE, 4G, there really, there is no 5G out here. And um, it's uh, 4G, and even the uh, incumbent cellular provider is still running some some possible 3G stuff and, and older LTE stuff. So cellular technology in this area is quite behind the times. Yeah, sounds like it. <laughs> good, good, good for you, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I've always been a big a uh, big fan of you know going to where the competition isn't, you know, or, or whatever. You know, I like I see a lot of people fighting for you know going into high density areas where there's like nine other providers. It's like, why there's so many other areas that you can choose that don't have that much competition, you know? So it's mm -hmm. very cool. Very cool. So your own sort of personal journey, you know, you're doing network engineering. How is that basically it just all OJT, you know, just figuring out as you go, have you done the you know, formal training or, you know, Who taught you. <laughs> So, um, both, uh, so I've learned a ton from, uh, his name's Joe, one of the other owners of Airbridge. Uh, he's been in the business for 20 years. I've learned a ton from him. He's been a great guy to, to learn from. He's got a ton of knowledge. Uh, so I've learned a lot from him. Uh, so I want to, I want to definitely get a shout out to, to him. He's been a ton, a, a big help. Other than that, it's been on the job training. And then as well as I've tried to further my education, um, there's not a, as, as you, I'm sure you guys are all aware, there's no like WISP certification out there. 
Yeah. Um, however, I have done the best I could to, I like, I have my CompTIA Network Plus. I studied, passed for, um, certified wireless network administrator. I've passed. I've done the Ubiquiti Broadband Wireless Admin training. I've done the Microtech Certified Network Associate Routing Engineer, um, things like that. And so uh, I think there's a CBRS certification. Um, gosh, I, I don't know. I think that's about it. Uh, so yeah, so I've, I've done those, those kind of things and just continue to try to educate myself. I, I go over the CCNA stuff a lot. Um, not using Cisco specific stuff though. It's kind of hard to learn the actual CCNA Cisco things, but, uh, even that stuff has some, some great material in it. Yeah. A lot of good core information for sure. So you guys are primarily microtech on the switching and routing side. Yeah. We're solely microtech on the switching and routing. Um, I'm, I'm a big fan of microtech as you can see. Uh, we do, uh, I, yeah, I think, uh, they offer a lot for a little, especially the new generation of hardware that's coming out. I think that you can really do a lot with a little, and it can go farther than a lot of people think. I think, yeah. I think you can do a lot more with it. Um, so yeah, so we pretty much use, we have some knit tonics for the switching. We have some, uh, yeah, that's about it. Um, but we've pretty much transitioned even to Microtech for the switching, the new CRS 300 series, the 328P. Um, is an awesome switch, I think, and configured correctly. I think they're awesome. Uh, we use the 1072s right now for some of our core and edges with a ton of uh, 1036s for a ton of our towers and other 4011s for some of the smaller ones. Um, and so uh, we're I'm really excited for the new generation of hardware. Still waiting for, for version 7 to become qu a little bit more stable and <laughs> things like that. Still waiting. But, still Same. waiting. But, uh, yeah. but yeah. I'm really excited. I think the new hardware, the new switch chips um, are going to be awesome. Because uh, one, one thing I heard is, is that uh, the same switch chip that they have in like your, your Meraki $2,500, $3,000 switches, they put in these new, you know, 300 switches, 2116s, things like that. So you get a really great switch chip really good hardware and i think i think uh, microtech is is a great way to go yeah i love all the the little things that microtech does outside of this industry that you can do with it i was just watching some cool videos of you know like gps asset tracking and stuff like that because it can you know through the scripting language that it has and the usb interface it can talk to a lot of other devices and you know relay that over an ip network and stuff like that so it's really really yep. cool stuff it is and it's something too where you can actually still find consultants that are reasonably priced, right? You know, you yeah, you know, you try to bring in a Cisco or a Juniper consultant in, and you just you start scratching out checks real hard and fast for that sort of thing. Where you know, there's there, and there's also in this industry, there's so much self generated knowledge and stuff like that, um, because there's you know so prolific, you know, in this this industry for sure. So very cool stuff. Yeah, that's, very cool. That's pretty much in general, though. I mean, that's why again, I love this industry so much. I mean. The, you know, the, the, the WISPs that are in here are so helpful with each other too, right? So, I mean, it really doesn't matter what you're using somebody else is, and they're probably more than willing to help you, you know, uh, or educate you or, you know, or try and solve that problem for you, which is really cool. Mm -hmm. Yes, definitely. I don't think I've ever seen a Verizon tech next to an AT&T van trying to help them sort out their problems, you know? So. <laughs> <laughs> nope. Nope. <laughs> that's funny. That's yeah. funny. So, you know, what do you think right now, you know, where the industry or, you know, your business or maybe the industry as a whole is, what are some of the biggest challenges you guys face on a daily basis or even big picture basis? So some of the challenges we face now is, uh, I would say five gigahertz is becoming a little bit crowded. Um, thanks to our film, it's helped a, a ton. So we're, we're greatly anticipating the, uh, you know, six gigahertz, uh, waiting for, for the gear to come out uh, and everything to, to sort itself out through there. Um, so waiting on that, um, gosh, uh, pricing on equipment. So, uh, our, our, our poo is a little bit lower than a lot of some, some other wisps out there. And so we can find it a bit challenging to afford the, the higher end Toronto gear to justify that. And so, um, so that's a bit challenging off, you know, um, some of the grants coming down the pike are going to be, you know, mandating a hundred by a hundred, uh, things like that, which is going to mandate, you know, we'll have to use the, the, the Toronto, the Cambium, things like that as, as awesome as ubiquity is. And I love the ubiquity gear. 
Um, it just can sometimes struggle a bit with the, the 100 by 100, 200 by 200 speeds, um, things like that. And so, uh, and as well as the grant funding coming down the pike is very skewed towards fiber. Um, and so uh, we're, we're trying to make some connections, relationships there to show that, hey, wireless has its place. Um, you know, satellite has its place, wireless has its place, fiber has its place. Um, but you know, some of the, some of the other incumbents around here are trying to tell people that they're going to get fiber to those houses that are 10 miles up, up in the boonies somewhere. And it's just not going to happen. Right. Um, and so, uh, I would say that's some of our, some of our biggest challenges, um, some of the biggest challenges we face. So I'm, I'm interested in your take on six gig, right? Because I mean, it was, you know, it was all the rage and you know, people are talking about it, not talking about it. Some people are waiting to build out, you know, for six gig. They don't want to build out anymore on five gig. I mean, do you find yourself not going into a new area because you're waiting for six gig or something like that, some new hardware to come out? Or, or you know, do you guys, if you find an area, you just go into it with what you have? Yeah. So, yeah, we're, we don't wait at all. Um, I am greatly anticipating, you know, like the EPMP 4600 looks like it's going to be a great product line. We aren't waiting. Um, we are looking to put up, you know, LTU, um, you know, uh, uh, wave, wave gear, you know, ubiquity uh -huh. wave, the 60 gigahertz, 60 gigahertz stuff. So no, we're not going to wait um, with the LTU and the RF elements and, and horns. Uh, we, we feel like we can just go, go straight ahead, and plow, plow forward. Yeah, for sure. I mean, you know, a lot of the waiting, you know, okay, I can understand a bit of it, but if you sit on your thumbs for the next, you know, a year, six months, whatever it turns out actually being fourth live, you know, it's just opportunity to pass you by and let other people come in and set up shop. You know, that's, is a small business, mm -hmm. kind of like what we are mentioning about the customer service side and reputation, you know, you get kind of dug in and as a local business, you know, they can get to know you personally and everything. And you're like, Hey, we're, we're here. So you know, when the incumbents yep. try to throw a lot of marketing bucks around or, you know, some of these yep. grant people, the newbies that roll into town, you're like, look, we're here. We've been established here for a year or two, whatever the time is, you know, and of course it's going to be, you know, competition is always a tough fight, but at the same time, like if you're not there now in the beginning of all this, then you're just kidding, going to get completely blown out of the water. So we've definitely been preaching folks, you know, don't First wait for the perfect solution. It just get yeah. it done get it done now then if you tweak or upgrade or something you know down the road a little bit then that's always an opportunity so or feed them tasty brisket yeah. they like <laughs> that too <laughs> yeah so yes i mean we're, we're we feel confident in offering 100 by 25 off of the ltu right you throw up a 30 degree um rf element horn off the ltu even on a 20 megahertz wide channel you get that 10x by 10x modulation yep. you can offer that 100 by 25 um, and we've been offering 50 by 10 off of the AC for five years, wow. right? Uh, with, uh, with the RF element horns and even the AC gear, we've been, we've been doing that. So when, you know, when, when Airbridge Broadway first started, um, the fastest you could get was like three by one, right? Yeah. For like 50 bucks a month. And, and you were doing good to get that. And, uh, we came in at 50 bucks a month and offered 20 by 10, 40 bucks a month gave you 40 by 10. Um, and so... We've been, we feel confident that, you know, just, just go, go where it's needed right now. Yeah. It's available, right? You, you can do it. Last, last question I have about that is, so what is your, cause we talk about the, the average use, right? You said three mm -hmm. by one. It's like really, you know, like seven by two is what people use, <laughs> you know, what they actually need yeah. versus, uh, you know, what they say they want and stuff. What's your average, you know, uh, customer, uh, usage roughly? So, uh, I, I can't remember exactly, but, uh, it's about two and a half, 2.5, three megabits per second average right. per user, whether somebody has 150, 20 megabit per second, um, on average people use 2.5 megabits per second. You'll have that person that uses the full 20, uses the full hundred, Sure, but you know, it's not very much. And so, uh, yeah, um, I think. We push somewhere around sixteen-ish gigabits per second at our at our peak, um, and that's for five thousand customers. So that's yeah. So and kind of related to that too, you know, with all the the different speed packages, do you have do people gravitate towards the higher speed packages, or is it like a middle mix? 
you know, what does that generally look like? Some sort of bell curve or. Yeah. So it's a, it's a kind of a mix. So our, our area ish here, there's not a ton of people that can really afford sometimes the higher plants. So we have a ton that are on the lower and a ton that are on the higher. So it's really, it's really, it's really a mixed um, of people that are on the, on the higher and lower. There's, it's kind of a 50, 50 uh, split there. There's no, you know, it's not like we have 90% on the lower and 10% on the higher or, or vice versa. Um, uh-huh. It's really a, a 50-50 split. How many people in your area are asking you, when are you going to have gig internet? Not much. Not many, actually. <laughs> uh, we have a, we have quite a few that want the Hunter make plans sure. um, and things like that, but we don't really don't get a lot of phone calls that want the like you know gig by gig or, or right. something like that. Yeah, I think, nice. I think a lot of people around here that, you know, if they can watch the Netflix, if they can, you know, play their games, they're, they're happy and they're not really yep. worried about the whole gig by gig. Exactly. If you have a reliable connection and they never get a hiccup, but why why ask for anything more, right? Yeah, I really think a hundred meg is going to be the the sweet sort of optimal spot for a long time, right? So, I mean, they most people could get by with a solid twenty, no problem, right? Yeah, uh, most you know, right. you're going to have some heavy users, but you know, so much is going on. Gotta have a gig. Gotta have a gig. And I'm like, when are you realistically going to use all this traffic? I think a hundred right. is, you know, for the most time. You know, you're you're watching multiple 4K 4K streams, playing some games. You know, you're you're doing all you're really going to do, unless some sort of wild, crazy tech comes out of there that you know, I don't know, some sort of weird AR nonsense or something like that. But that's been coming down the pipe for like the last ten years now, and it's not even remotely close to happening. So, no, I think it's definitely a sweet spot. And you know, with the the current the LTU stuff, you can do it. Uh, the AX equipment that we're going to start seeing here pretty much in the very near term. You know, I think we're we're in a really good spot from a technology perspective. A lot of it's just marketing perception for sure. Yep. All right. Well, you know, we've covered a pretty good bit of information here. You know, it's it's always really interesting to kind of learn uh, where people come from, how they get started, the different networks, you know, we've had so many WISP operators and they all run completely different networks. And it's really good to get that sort of different perception or view on things. So, um, anything in particular you kind of want to, you know, cover or, you know, we've, we've been pounding you with questions so far. So <laughs> anything you, uh, you want to talk about or I want to bring up or anything? Yeah, just a couple quick things, a um, couple quick shout outs to RF Elements. So when I first started with the Backwoods Wireless, yeah. um, he, he was using nano stations as access points, right? Oh. And yeah, oh. and then oh. Uh, oh. nano station oh. M5s. And uh, we moved to the Ubiquity Rocket M5s with the Ubiquity Sector. So it was a good upgrade. Yeah. And, um, and so the, the actual real first tower that we put up, it was Ubiquity Sectors with Rocket uh, 5AC. Um, Airbridge came in and put up a 90 foot tower with RF element, uh, horns, prisms, and it was awesome. And, uh, you know, I was doing installs back in those days and I would do an install off of the rocket at at a five AC with the, um, ubiquity sectors. And I'm like, I've got perfect line of sight. I know it's pointed right at me because I'm the one that put the sector on the tower. (laughs) Right. (laughs) And like my chains are off. The signal's not very good on all these things. And so I was like, guys, we got to swap this out for RF elements, uh, horns, and uh, prisms. And I tell you what, I, we did. And this even gain isn't everything, right? The, the specifications you see on paper aren't everything. The ubiquity sectors technically might have more gain. But I tell you what, we swapped out that ubiquity sector for that RF elements and the prism. And the signal dropped by like 10 dB, got like 10 dB better, perfect chains and everything so uh our filament horns are the best um another quick Thank story you. i would say uh is that you know we we put up a big tower and um we we put a 90 degree uh sector symmetrical uh sector up right well we quickly filled that up and we just put another 90 degree sector right on top of it we quickly filled that up and put another and another <laughs> so at some point, we have four 90-degree symmetrical horns all pointed in the same direction right on top of each other. And, uh, you know, we're like, okay, you know, modulation is suffering. I mean, it was still really good, especially considering it's up on a grain style, a lot of noise and things like that. So uh, I, we, we came in, re-engineered the site. We swapped out the four 90-degree symmetricals for four asymmetrical um, 20s. So we took the 30s and we swapped them on edge to do 20s. And so we have the same number of of APs, just 
and the same number of sectors, but instead of 490s, we have 420s. And I tell you what, that made the world a difference too. Yeah. And so it's definitely better to do it that way than the the 490s stacked on stacked on top of each other. If you have to do it at first, go for it. But I would highly encourage, you know, do you know, just if you just do, you know, 30 degrees here, 20 degrees, whatever it's needed to get try and get that density instead of stacking APs uh, on top of each other. Um, learning curve, so, right? Yeah, learn learning curve. Um, and uh, and I would uh, one th- thing I would say too is that I think you can do a lot more with Ubiquity and Macrotech than a lot of people might give the equipment credit for. Okay. Um, I have seen you know you Cambium, Trana, it's all super great gear. Don't get me wrong. You can you know I I saw you know with a Nig seventy and seventy three Trana push two hundred megabits per second. You're just not going to do that with Ubiquity, right? Um, but I do think that uh, between RF elements, Microtech, and Ubiquity, um, there is they can do a lot more. I think than than a lot, a lot of people can give them credit for. For sure, for sure. The the Rocket Prism. I mean, all the Ubiquity APs. Those Rocket Prisms, some uh, good costing Microtech routers have made a lot of people a lot of money. A lot over of money. Yes, yeah. a lot of money over the years for yeah. sure. So, but yeah, it's like everything else, man. You just gotta know what your tool is and how to swing it. So. For sure, for yeah, sure. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, if the tr- if you need the Toronto, go for it. It's awesome gear. The hardware is great. Yep. Um, it can again. I mean, it can push two, three hundred megabits per second to a customer in places that even like it's you're just ubiquity just isn't going to do. And so if if those are the if that's what you're doing, that's what you need. Um, but if if what you're looking at is doing fifty megabits per second and hundred megabits per second, the RF elements, Microtech, and, and and ubiquity can can do that. I think. Yeah, I mean, and we still see a lot of people that are pulling both different styles, right? So, you know, high density and, and you need that sort of capacity or, you know, things like that. Go one way, the other areas, you know, go where it's most cost effective. Look at what your ROI is going to be and, you know, make the best decision mm-hmm. for you. Not just the near term or because it's fancy and shiny, but realistically thinking <laughs> what it's going to look like two, three, five years down the road. So, yep. Well, very cool. Very cool. Well, that's about everything that I've got. And I know, Elijah, you've got a, a busy day ahead of you, as always. The the adventures of a wisp always keep you on your toes, right? Wisp never, life. Yeah, wisp life. Never never a boring moment, for sure. So Never. Um, I guess in closing, uh, anyone looking to find you? Um, you know, they got any questions or, you know, want to talk about your experiences or anything like that? If you don't mind, we can throw your, your email address up. Or what's the best way for people to find you? Yeah, so uh, the best way to find me is probably email is just Elijah at airbridgebroadband.com or I'm also on LinkedIn. You can find me at Elijah Zeta. I'm friends with Tassos and Caleb and uh, some of the others in the in the WISP industry. So uh, just if you see me on their, their connections list, that, that's going to be me. Um, and that's pretty much where, where I'm at. I'm not too much of a social media guy. I'm not on Twitter and, and all that stuff. Um, probably best but, for your uh, sanity. Yeah. So. yeah, good for you. <laughs> good for you. <laughs> Oh, very cool, very cool. Tazos, people looking for us, where can they find us as always? They could find us on social media, anywhere on Facebook, Instagram, and a lot of the WISP uh, groups that are there. Of course, you could always find us at our website, rfelements.com. You could always email us, tazos at rfelements.com, caleb at rfelements.com. And for anybody else that's out there, like Elijah, that might want to be on the show, we'd love to have you on. So if you're out there, if you're curious, Send us an email, send us a private message or something like that, and uh, let's get you on here talking and introduce you to the rest of the WISP world. All right, all right. Well, until next time, everybody, we'll talk to you later. Bye. See ya. See you so long.